What is it you want, Barry? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. Come with me if you want to live. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. The Force will be with you. Always. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to 20th Century Geek. I'm your regular host, Scott Weatherly. And today we are doing our quarterly Patreon choice. That's right, the Patreon, the top chiefs chose today's episode we gave them the choice and they made the we filled in the poll and we're doing a commentary we're going to be doing a commentary on the pilot episode of the x-files and before we start i thought i'd give a little bit of information about the x-files i'm assuming most people if not all people uh listen to this have uh at some point watched at least an episode so you get the concept yeah you get the concept Mulder, fox Mulder, and dana scully who go around solving all kinds of unsolvable kind of crimes and um, the central premise being around a potential uh, alien invasion of Earth um, through shady government agencies. I loved this show as a kid. Uh, it came out in uh, 93. In fact, I think the first episode, I'll just check, the first episode I think was aired in September. There you go, September 10th, 1993. So I was, um, I'd literally just started secondary school that month, uh, and I remember being to- told about um, the x by a lad called uh, Anthony Gibbons in science class, and he was telling me about the episode Ice, where they go to the Antarctic, and um, they find those worms. It's, it's an episode basically based around the thing. Um but it was a great episode. I loved it. I remember I went back and watched it. And from that, I was a fan. Um, watched. Pretty much watched as much as I could after that. I think I probably teaked off uh, towards the end. I don't think I watched initially. I don't think I watched Beyond Season 7 um, when it was broadcast. And I've gone back and watched them all now. Uh, and I think they're great. But I was well into read all the, sort of the, uh, the comics. There was a magazine that... Um, that was available and had a comic book series that, that sort of ran with it, which was really cool. And there was sort of a spin-off and tie-in novels. And they, they also did comic book versions of the episodes, which was cool. They did an episode like Space. I remember, I remember the one, I had the one for Space. And there was another one, which was good. Um, uh, but we're doing an episode, we're doing the pilot for a reason, because I think it's the very first thing. I mean, the pilot is supposed to, and we shall see set the tone for the the show um and i often think that shows especially like this you know they sort of start at a point and then they sort of evolve a little bit usually over the first and second series to hit that stride and i think that's true of the x-files they probably hit it quite early on to be honest towards the end of that first season and um julian anderson and and uh David Coveney sort of fit into those roles incredibly well and you get this supporting cast that grows up over the years uh, so yeah, it was a great show. But they so say the tie-in novels. There was two I really liked. There was one called Whirlwind, which I believe was the first one. Actually, no, Goblins. Was it called Goblins? I think was the first one, and uh, then the second one was Whirlwind. And those two books I absolutely adored. Really adored them. I think I read them several times. I might think I can read them again in the future. But yes, I really enjoyed uh, all the X Files stuff. And so what we're going to do today. As I say, we're going to talk about the pilot episode, created by Chris Carter, um, also created Millennium, another series which I really enjoyed. And um, this first episode was a bit of a was supposed to be a seller. It obviously sets the tone, introduces the characters, and introduces. So you can obviously guess that this one's going to be about alien abduction. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you've got it, uh, just so you know, uh, before we start, I'm currently watching watching this on Disney Plus. Uh, through Disney Plus Star, but the uh, the episodes are also available on uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, they are on Prime. They are free on Prime. And if anyone in the states, I believe in the states, they're also on Netflix. Um, but you can get hold of them if you haven't got a hold of them. Tough. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but anyway, let's dig in. Let's uh, take a look at this first episode. So, skip intro. No chance, mate. 
get the fantastic X Files logo. That X with the break in it, the printed X that became such a uh, what's it? So this is interesting. It says the following story is inspired by actual documented accounts. This was originally the premise of one of the parts of the show. It was going to have recounts, sort of recounts of actual um, supernatural and paranormal events. It doesn't really go that way. I don't think I don't think that's ever used again, if I remember rightly. But yeah, that was one of the ideas, uh, one of the concepts for the show. I do kind of like those things. You know, they did that thing based on real events. They did it with um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Anyway, just watching this, a young woman uh, falling down the hill. So it's these cold opens. And this is something that sort of the show became incredibly well known for. These cold opens work so well. I mean, this one's a little bit obvious watching it. You know, you're getting the lights and this guy walks out and it's clear, you know... She's going to be abducted. But, I mean, the, the quality of this is good. It looks like a good, well-budgeted uh, 90s show. I mean, it looked incredibly 90s. It's 1993, so not surprising. But it looks bob-on. Um, but that's a cracker of an opener. I think that's a really good opener. You don't know squat. I mean, it's, it sells itself as... This is the thing, just watching now. you got the... Um, the text coming in in the bottom corner to give the location and all this kind of stuff. This was clearly all tied, and that, I love that that stays, um, ties it into other crime shows. I mean, I don't know watch that many of them, but I'm thinking like, you know, I don't know, CSI, but, um, you know, new Crime on the Streets, whatever the hell they're called, those crime shows where they sort of have, like, you know, the location makes it feel like it's a file. Um, one of the things that I like about the X-Files... Um, see the, the thing about this idea in this episode that's happening again this, is, this show really does tap into two things uh, that I think are pure Americana and it's the sort of the the, um, the idea of the mystery around small town America I mean at the same time as this you also had David Lynch uh, doing Christ Almighty um, Lisa Palmer what was it called Twin Peaks so you had this come out Twin Peaks, and again, that's about small town America, and there's just the secrets and the mystery hidden behind small town America. And the X Files did it perfectly on a number of occasions, like up to I think Home is probably one of the best episodes doing that. But then they also take the Mickey out of it; they parody it in several episodes. There's one with um, Luke Wilson in as a sort of, and they're each recounting a different um, version of events, and he has like book teeth in one and stuff. It's very cool. But yeah, that's one of the things this show does really well. But the other thing this thing does does excellently is this idea of layers of authority, um, which we'll get onto in a little bit. Also, okay, in this opening, he's just been introduced to Agent Scully, and this is her being interviewed by the uh, cast of characters. Uh, none of them returned to be replaced by Agent Skinner, or direct Skinner later on. Um and they got the cigarette smoking man in the background. That was supposed to be a bit part. He was literally supposed to be there as a sort of like a, uh, a, a just a mystery character. It was never to, there to be a um, recurring character thing. But he became people asked so many questions about it. Didn't know that he he was brought back, which I think is fantastic. Such a great little nugget. Um, first and foremost, as well, Gillian Anderson, stunning. Sorry, I had a real crush. In fact, I still do have a real crush on Gillian Anderson. I think the woman's absolutely stunning. Um, but again, she she ties into this idea of the competent female FBI agent. She's like the second stage of uh, Clary Starling uh, from Silence of the Lambs. She's clearly based on that model. The way she's dressed, the way she's presented in this episode, especially these early stars, is clearly that sort of riff on... Jodie Foster in in that film. No, no, not to downplay it. It's it's a shorthand to make it clear, you know, who she is and what she is. Um. But yeah, I think she's fantastic in this. And this this thing about why she describes uh, Mulder. I'm about to make this, you know, um, you know, no one in here but the FBI's most unwanted. Um. But when she sort of says about how she knows about Mulder and he has this reputation, 
it, it, I love the fact that it sets him up as saying, oh, he's actually had this massive contribution to the FBI. He's done all this stuff. He's actually got a really solid reputation. And now he's sort of like shat on it. And it's all a bit, he's a bit spooky, as they call it. Um, it sets up well. Interestingly, though, this is the thing about this, this show as well. You then meet him, and it's David Duchovny. And it's this guy, and you go, all right. He's an attractive bloke, and it always is. It's typical Americana. Uh, this idea of what any TV show really the most attractive people, but uh, yeah, he's hidden away in this basement, does all this stuff, but he's still David Duchovny. Um, he he brings a certain charm. I will say this is one of the things about this show is that it works in this thing of. Um, the the opposites. I mean, they're, they are another great um, buddy. It's a buddy duo, you know, like a cop show almost. Like they work in that way. Like he's the believer, she's the skeptic. She's pretty straight laced. He's weird and a bit funny. Um, but it and it taps into the humor. Like Chris Carter wrote this, and he had this ability to do this to tap into the humor, and that's what what's works well for most shows. Um. You can, so we now get into the case. So the girl that was killed at the beginning is is now um, then I go through the the case file photos. It's all very typical. Um, <clears throat> the two two jabs in the back. Now that does relate to obviously real cases. I became not obsessed, but I became very interested in UFO cases following sort of my interest in this show. And I read loads of book about aliens and all sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, and this idea of this thing the thing that comes up later as well is this thing that they, we'll get to it is the um, implant the nasal implant <clears throat> watching this now what were you in 2021 and this is 93 so you're talking 18 years ago so this show is no Christ more than that I was about to say 18 18 years ago is 2002 this is 28 years old <laughs> this is a full adult old this show and it does show through the technology. One of the things I think is funny is later on you get mobile phones and stuff like that for nice three, but like we've got a projector and slides and nothing, you know. <clears throat> Nowadays, iPad, watch all the stuff. Um, so it's it clearly dates it, but it can be it can be seen as quaint, but it definitely lives in this period in the 1990s. Um, Sorry. Need a drink. Need my uh, X Files juice. Um, again, so they're now going. This straight away, they have them as an, an antagonistic towards each other. Like, you know, he's gone straight in for the. Um, the it, there's a shot that says, I'm going to. But the, she, he goes straight for the weird. And she's like, well, no, clearly there's an, there's an explanation, but it's going to be something we know. But when he says he'll see her tomorrow and stuff, there's a smile that she gives. And it's quite clear from the offset that this was never going to be a romance. I don't think this was ever supposed to be set up in that way. It became that a lot later, but they were always supposed to be platonic. And um, it, it just, just yeah, they, they, they lay shots throughout this to show this growing sort of friendship and relationship, especially towards the end. They slightly counter it on several occasions, which is a little irritating. But it's uh, this thing around the turbulence as well. So we we've got the turbulence of the of the plane, um, and her. Oh, this is a fair flight. But get, get, this is the thing. Sort of, it's it's trying to cram a lot in. To show about UFOlogy. There's a great bit coming actually. So this idea about you know the the the, the ship the ship the planes turbulence is one thing you know like so um, what do they call them planes being buzzed by um, UFOs and all that kind of stuff. These things happen and then they do something similar. They get an electronics issue in a second and the car stops and he gets out and he marks it on the road. Never sure if he's ever going to come back again. Like, what does that X prove on the road other than to remind you of it's the X Files? But here you go. First episode in. 
and he's eating uh, uh, sunflower seeds. And she she sort of has this thing around, obviously again re- repeating the uh, the uh, you know the science of it all. It keeps coming back to that bit. She almost in the in the beginning she's very sort of um, almost condescending. That's the like so the theater played her to be that. And I'm never sure she was supposed to be. That. She's supposed to become. She she it happens like the show. She always almost never sees the 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 event the the paranormal the supernatural. She's always the absolutely absence just to keep her give her the ability to remain the skeptic, but she definitely becomes more accepting and open to to Mulder's theories and ideas. But there are moments in this where she comes across as like, oh, you yeah, you're the weird one, and you know almost being uh, condescending or patronizing, which. Is a bit of a problem at times, um, but as I say, they're finding their feet. It's a good, solid open. I mean, what are we? Oh, I don't know, actually, <laughs> some way into it, um, and we're starting to see. But this thing of drawing the X on the road, like I have no idea what he's supposed to do with it. Like, is he supposed to come back? No, it just appears to be sort of like random, petty um, graffiti. I don't know, weird. But again, we get into this thing like so it's caught co- coastal northwest Oregon March. They're in this small town in Oregon. Beautiful place, by the way. I mean, it's a lovely coastal town. But it really is this thing of like, you know, they want to get into this idea of small town America. Um and that's where the sort of the mysteries are. Um this is the other thing as well. Watching this episode come out, this is one of the first times I found out that you could exhume a body. That's what they're about to do now. But more than that, that you could just sort of ask for that to happen. Like, you know, if you had the authority, you could be like, oh, yeah, just dig them back up and have a look. Um, and in this part of the episode, this is another thing where... There you go. So this is the county coroner coming in to... Basically, like, you know, who did you think you are? What you're doing? Like, sort of show this is the flash of authority. So this is what I'm saying. This is the layers of authority that they keep showing in this show and it's it's to build up to later on to show that there's always someone above you that's always the point of this show is that there's always you always have someone to report to so this guy's a county coroner so that's his authority and obviously then they've got the sheriff who's slightly before above him and then above that the fbi is the federal bureau and then above them you start to get into the secret organizations in the government and that sort of thing so it just works well to constantly show these levels of um, bureaucracy and authority that exist in these things. Even in the weirdest, like grossest horror and science fiction things, there's still this level of bureaucracy. Like someone's going to report to somebody else. So, you know, you get to. And it happens even for Mulder. Like there are people that Mulder is able to press, or, you know, to put the foot on or whatever. But then they have to report to Skinner. And then Skinner's got to go up to his boss, and then even above that, you've got the cigarette smoking man, and so on and so forth. Like, it's all a part of this chain of authority, and there's always somebody to report to. Um, and I think that's, it sort of it starts to sort of show a little bit. And even in this very first episode, they're trying to show that that these guys are, yes, they are the protagonists of the show. Yes, they are the center of this, but they're not in charge. Like that, that's not their role in this. They are there to. To follow the mystery and to do so, they need to be in the dark for some things. Um, just so is in that. So you got you're about to get the bit where it's uh, coffin falls. Have exhumed the body. The coffin falls. This thing that's revealed in the body became a bit of an icon as well. So they show this sort of. It's, <laughs> they seem to know it was supposed to be in there, but. It's a proper decomposed, gross-looking body. It's like mummified or whatever. And I... It... <laughs> I, I love the... F- I mean, it's, it looks proper. I mean, I remember... Th- th- I was describing the body. The body's sort of like, you know, uh, desiccated. It, it's, it's sort of mummified. It's gr- it's... 
Um, and she's about to do the autopsy. But to me, I'm like, when I was a kid, like this, I remember some of this really disturbed me. Maybe not so much this episode, but episodes like when they go to the, the, the freak show and ice bothered me for some reason. And some of the others with the monsters in. Uh, Eugene Tombs. Jesus, that guy gave me fucking nightmares. Really does it manage to tap into the horror and the weirdness. And they don't skimp on it, which is really cool. Um, I love this. He's like, not human? What is it? Well, it could be anything. She's like, yeah, it's a chimp. It's an ape. Like, what does it say? If it runs like a horse, if it sounds like a horse, if it looks like a horse, it's a horse. You know, you don't have to think it's a zebra. Um, you know, Occam's razor will tell you the most logical thing is going to be this. And I love that Occam's razor can also be applied in different ways. So for her, she applies it from a scientific and sceptical point of view. And for Mulder, it's like Occam's razor is what well, the most common sense approach is going to be. Aliens. Um it, and that will you know, roll out across the entire series for the next nine seasons. Um, but as a, yeah, as an opener, again, I'm, sort of, I'm still going to crack on about this. I'm loving the fact that they are laying this out perfectly. Like the, I, I get the feeling that this this episode in particular was written and rewritten. And they have a number of things that they wanted to hit. Certain marks that they really wanted to hit. And they were determined to do that. Um, and so, you know, they, they didn't force them in, but they managed to get them in, uh, in in a really sort of well-structured way. Now, this again, okay, so look, sorry to go back to this, and if you're watching it, um, so she's sat in the bed going through her files. We've now got the little grey uh, nasal implant. But he's just tapped on the door. The smile she gives shows, suggests a... Um, uh, an attraction, but it or, but it's still terming on patronising, sort of like a tolerance almost. But anyway, they, they've got this thing here about this this nasal cavity, this this um, device that exists and lived in the cavity. And this was a big thing. It comes back to the show they have in the shoulders and there's other things. But these, oh, sorry, these things existed in, in real life. They have been found in people. Do I believe in uh, UFOs and aliens? Eh, that's for a different show, or maybe not. Um, but I like the fact again that they are tapping into this sort of the real UFOlogy ideas, and they're not scared. You know, they're not holding back of saying like, "Oh, it could be this, it could be that, that." No, we don't know what the fuck this is. Like, it's we found it in the nasal cavity. Don't have a clue what it is, um, and we're not going to try and give an explanation. And that's what's quite cool about it. So, One of the things about this episode as well, it centres around a bunch of kids. It's just the class of 89. So it's about a bunch of kids that seem to have had an experience and are now being rounded up um, by these beings, by these alien things. One of the things that's, that's kind of disappointing, I could be wrong actually, so if there's a big fan out there that's going to correct me on this, my understanding is that this is never returned to. And this would have been a great thing to sort of, if they really wanted to round it back out to... What do they call it? Tie up loose ends or bring it full circle would have been to have this be, um, uh, you know, th- these characters are actually a part and parcel of this thing, they're part of an experiment or something that was being done in 89 that uh, was part of this invasion, part of the colonization. That's the word they use, colonization, isn't it? Because they're going to look like us and stuff. Um, that's what that's what I think it would that'd have been great, really, wouldn't it? To bring it full circle, bring back like Billy Soames or some of the other characters. Um Check the back, there we go, the the, the dots are back. Um this, this, again this is what I'm saying that the pacing of this episode not to say that every episode is great, I have to say it before we go into it, like the this series has seasons that sort of are up and down but and also episodes like there's some fantastically well written and well paced episodes and then some that are just not but this one i wouldn't even say this was in the top 10 of episodes it's really not there were some absolutely barnstormers of an episode but even so this episode this pilot as a pilot it, it shows why this was sort of produced handed out to the execs and then flew from there um, it makes total sense why this was such a success. It's well paced, it's well acted, uh, the drama's good, the concept's great. Um, and although it's an introductory episode, although it, what's the way to put it? 
it's an introductory to a story. It's the beginning of a story. It doesn't feel like each of the characters are being created on screen. And you can sometimes get that from sort of pilot episodes where they feel like they're being put together a little bit before your eyes. Both Mulder and Scully in particular feel fleshed out already. Like there's a bit more to them. They've come ready formed in many ways. And that goes down to Gillian Anderson and David Coveney. Um, they do change. There's a bit of change around them. But the pair of them able to flick between humour and the drama and the tension and stuff is just so well played. And again, I think this goes to Chris Carter as well and his writing and direction of this episode. Um, just goes to show. Like I, I can imagine that sort of being in the executive room in one of those exec cinemas somewhere in... I mean, was it Fox? I can't remember who did this now. Of course, it must have been Fox. It's on bloody star. Sitting in that room in sort of 92 or early 93... And someone rolling this and being like, oh, this is what we've got for the season up ahead. Let's have a look. And playing this and being like, Jesus, this is... We're onto something here. This felt this felt from the offset like it was going to be something. You know, you watch those TV shows and you watch the first episode and straight away you're onto this idea of like, oh, no, no, this is... this is We're onto something with this. This is uh, something special. Um, and that's what this feels like. And to the extent of like this was mimicked massively. There was like um, uh, like a parallel show that was about I think it was set in the fifties, and I remember watching a couple of episodes. But because of this, you you get the return of like the Outer Limits. You get there's a show called Roswell, um, you know, uh, Dark Skies, all these alien based shows. I mean, for Christ's sake, this show is the reason that the alien autopsy video turned up. I think 95, 96? That video of that grey being dissected up that turned out to be a hoax. It was two guys that sort of did it as a hoax. All of that comes from this. Like 90s, um, uh, you know, internal paranoia. Um, a lot of it comes from this show. It really does. We do, you know, the Cold War was over. We'd had some sort of like you know the American particular had a scuffle in the Middle East with the first Gulf War, and it was a general peace across most of the nineties, and so you turn on the gut you know the turn on the in, you become internalized as to who you become suspicious of, and that's what this show sort of like in, are they inspired but basically it was a contributing factor to that idea, but the fact that like UFOs, UFOlogy and the idea of aliens became so popular in, in the 90s is, is down to this show yeah without a doubt um and also one of the things i would say is as well is this show and again you can see it in this pilot sort of um was an early birth of modern television this idea of sort of like episodic yet overreaching arcs you know the monster of the week followed by the main arc and that sort of thing and you know, this this really inspired all the other shows. I mean, you know, this allowed things like Buffy and Angel and all those other shows beyond that. Because up until this point, like most shows were episode of the week, or it was either episode of the week, or it was it was a soap. That was it, really. And then you get this sort of introduced to stuff. Like without this, you don't get. No, this is a leap. So stick with me. But without this, you don't get like Breaking Bad or, or Game of Thrones. Like, this is the start of that pre- premium television starts in the early 90s. So, this show has got a real place in pop culture history. I think it's really worth noting that. And, again, I don't, I don't think there's anything in this episode where you go, oh, yeah, I'd fine tune this, I'd fine tune that. Like, this comes fully formed. Um,. They're about to be the the alien thing. Um, there we go. So we get the uh, um, the, the again these other moments. This is a time what they call it time slip, lost time. They've now got lost time. They've been driving along. They've, they've lost time. Is it like seven minutes? We'll check in a minute. I'll tell you in a second. There you go. They've lost nine minutes. Um, and I love this. Is what I, was say, I love Mulder's response. Mulder's response is like, "I've been abducted." 
I lost nine minutes. All right, well, for nine minutes, what happened to you? Never returned to in the show. At no point did they sort of like, because later on, Mulder's like, oh, and it's, it's, ah, so the X does come back. So the X that you drew earlier on the, on the road is the same place. But this time loss, never returned to. Like When they come down the show, again, this is something you should be doing. I'd be like, oh, let's, let's really make this tight. Let's go back to that first episode, right? That nine minutes that Skull, Mully and Mully, Scully and Mulder were abducted for. What happened in those nine minutes? You can do a lot in nine minutes. Um, and I think it'd be great if there was this thing of later down the, the road where they were like, that first time you met, you were abducted. You went missing for nine minutes. During that time, we took samples and we started, you know, we implanted you. Do you think, you know, do you think this had happened later? Oh, we always knew about you, Mulder, sort of thing. Which is what you do learn. Um, I just think it would have been a nice little twist. Maybe even within just within this season. I mean, you get to meet Deep Throat in this um, uh, this season. Unfortunate name. I mean, I know they have X later on. But, um, yeah, give, call him God Deep Throat. And I know why they call him Deep Throat. Because I think that goes back to the... Um, was it Watergate? Right, just quickly, this moment. So, you know, they've tried to be serious and stuff. Yet you still get Gillian Anderson in her pants and bra. I'm not going to complain because I think the woman is absolutely stunning, but it's the it's the titillation. It has to introduce, it has to introduce the titillation. Now I like the fact that they've had the nine minutes of lost time, and the two she's now been got the two the two dots on her back. So there is this callback to this idea of they could be abducted. Um, but it's I mean it's not really played for titillation, not really. Um, but it could have been, you know. There's, there's still a little bit there because you, you get to see her body. I mean, she's you know, she's what in her early early twenties. I think she's like twenty three, twenty four when this happened. Um, and I like the fact that look, although she's a pure skeptic, in this moment, her seeing those dots on her back and introducing that, and there's there's nine minutes of lost time. It starts to nib, even this early doors, it nibbles away at her scepticism. And this suggests to me at one point they may they weren't entirely sure how the dynamic was going to play out. And it may have been that sort of her scepticism was going to erode before it, it does down the line. Um, okay, so now we're getting you know the backstory. So Mulder is now relaying the story of how his sister was abducted. Uh, when he was 12. Uh, and the fact that his life had been sort of directed to finding her after, probably after this disappearance. And again, it comes down to this pacing. Like, it all feels natural. Like, you know, um, he's comforting her really by re- relaying the story, but it's more exposition. And. You know, and for us, his psychology and their psychology together. I'm really struggling not... I'm trying to talk constantly. It's really quite difficult to do this commentary thing. It's easier with, with other people. Um, but yeah, this idea of the sort of... The the, the exposition of what? Probably about... Let's have a quick look. So you're about half an hour in. Um, to a 45-minute show. And this is it now. You've sort of had all your drama. This is sort of middle of Act 2. And you're getting all the exposition now about... Um, because you got a lot of her stuff at the very beginning. You got sort of Scully is the one that's relatively more two dimensional than 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 Mulder. Like she's just this very straight laced on this other stuff. And this is where you sort of learn that he's actually been a bit of a kook his entire life, and he's he's sort of retelling of all this information and, and stuff is clearly about him. Um, you get the depth, but it sets also the conspiracy in place. There's a great line there where he says, the only reason I've been allowed to investigate all these things for so long is because somebody else is letting me do it. And again, that's again, we get to this idea of levels of bureaucracy and authority. Like, Mulder clearly knows that, yeah, he's doing this thing, but it could stop any minute, and that happens in the show, obviously. At some point, but... He he knows there's someone above him letting him do this. It gives him the the, 
the sway to do these investigations. Um, but he also like, this is the thing. So now he's talking about how he this thing about uh, hypnosis, this idea of regression and hypnotic regression and stuff, which is proven to be complete garbage. It can be loaded with all kinds of suggestion and influence within it, and should not and does not get taken seriously anymore. However, he it does lay out in the nineties. It was a big thing. I mean, we've, the other thing to remember is that ninety three, um, we are still, I say we, uh, America and Britain in particular, are still very much, well, to the tail end. But we've still got some stuff to get the, the satanic panic. So this idea of regression and hypnosis is still pretty strong. People are using it to sort of identify people, you know, through kids that have been abused and Satanists and, and all this idea of hypnotic suggestion through music and all this other shit. So this idea of regression therapy was big at this point. Um, so it's not surprising that it was used in this show. Uh, so, yeah, 93 is a bit of a, you know, a bit of a pivot. Yeah, it sort of it's tails off after this because you've had the sort of... Um, the music point and all this other stuff. It's that's the sort of trail off, um, and we get from we go from Satanists into aliens. Um, it looks like we're always looking for an other. We're always looking for some supernatural entity to take to you know, to do something for us, or to be doing something to us. So, mm. there you go. So we're now going to get so the, the, one of the girls that they met in the hospital earlier on um, is again showing the sort of the lost time. And so the monkey body's been been stolen. Um, it, it, this idea of conspiracy is really strong through this. I'm really trying to think of other things. I'm trying not to just watch the episode because this is where I'm really sort of enjoying this show. I watched this. I literally watched this the other day uh, to prepare for this, and I'm still going. Oh yeah, I just want to sit and watch this. I'd love to just sit and watch this. Um, So again, you're getting down to this small town conspiracy because they're saying this idea of the the autopsy bay and everything has been destroyed, and it was clearly done by someone local. Which, um, doing it by someone local. Sorry, I'm watching the show again. Doing it by someone local. So you know, it's sort of this idea of what's being hidden, this idea of hiding under the surface. So now we're talking. So there's another girl, the final girl, really, in the situation, Teresa Nemitz, and. She, she was involved in the eighty nine incident. She's one of the few, and her dad is the county coroner, and she he's obviously been trying to protect her. Um, but it's this thing again of uh, knowledge, secret knowledge. You know, it's, it's, it, do do you think this is true? I mean, you know, it's less. No, it's it's sort of still considered to be fact and a way of life in Britain, but it's massively sort of acknowledged in America that you can travel from coast to coast. And you will, you know, you you can stop off on the freeway, and you can and you can go to these big cities and that sort of thing. But the 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 what they call it, the the center, the heart of America is very much made up of small town America, and you can go from small small cities to small towns to to what is basically a hamlet and stuff. And within these places, like you know, traditions are ripe, and they sort of survive on these ideas of sort of very rural, very conservative ideas, and even within a country like America, which is hugely technologically advanced. These localized places love to try and stay local, and you know the outsiders. And in many cases, this sort of feeds into the conspiracies and the the, the concerns of today, in this idea that uh, the overreach of government. I mean, you know, I'm not going to go to all the January sixth stuff, but this idea of the overreach of government and this idea that you know these places need to be able to govern themselves. And in governing themselves, what does that mean? How small does small government have to be before there is no government? I mean, that's, you know, this this show, um, this show has a very conservative message in many ways because it's really sort of leading to this idea of there is big government. I mean, if this show is picking up now during COVID, you know, you have all kinds, all those conspiracy theories of control. It's all, in fact, it's all in this show again. This idea of um, when, well, at one point they go to a place towards the end of this series, I think, in this season, and they find that the 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 warehouse of the rows and rows of um, boiling cabinets, and everybody's stored in them. And, and um, Scully finds hers and her sisters and stuff in this in this cabinet, and it completely sort of goes into this idea that uh, we've all been tracked and traced. 
You know, we've all got a microchip in us now, so this year. If you've had the jab, you've been microchipped. It's complete nonsense. Like, it's utter garbage. And one of the things that this sort of thing... And they even call out, I think, at one point in the show, like, how are they paying for all this? Like, you know, it's got to be from the taxes. Um... But uh, yeah, it really does feed into this. I mean, it was this was a conspiracy show, um, but even even um, even um, before like Kobe or other things, like this is clearly. If anything, this shows why those cons- those got like, Q and on and stuff is complete garbage. Is because this shows the complexity and the bureaucracy that sort of has to exist for these things to work, and it's complete and utter nonsense. Um, but small town America is this idea of self governing. They love this idea that you know you want to be self governed. We want to do this thing. We've got you know we've got to be able to um, have that freedom and that sort of thing. And that freedom allows things to stay local. Um, and it does sort of happen in Britain less so. That we're very we're much sort of more communal in Britain on a wider scale. But you do definitely get pockets of it. Like if you go to some small villages, you know, that have been mining villages for the last four hundred years, very much, you know, you'll get people that have been there for generations and stuff. And and so you do get traditions. Um now it's become more folklore mythology, you know, in this idea, but uh, thinking uh, the wicker man, that sort of thing. But and that that this what the show this show really taps into. Um it's both about the macro you know you get this idea of the macro the massive universe i mean it, you know toward, by the end of the show or by the middle of this show you've got shape-shifting aliens and you know two races of aliens warring to try and um colonize the planet um you know this macro thing of like we are the base for this war or part of this war right down to an episode like home where it's about an inbred family that terrorizes the sort of the locals between that like it really shows that sort of the the um the different perspectives and the different scales of the horror and the sci-fi um and that's what I love, and that's what this episode's really hammering home, is this idea of the macro, this idea of the universe, and these entities living out there that are coming to this small town. Like, why here? And that's the thing that doesn't answer, like, it never gets to it. Like, why this small Oregon town? What the fuck is going on here that everyone gives a shit about? Um, And that's what I find most interesting. But, and really it goes back to... Uh, in some parts, like this idea of like uh, the um, H.P. Lovecraft idea of sort of like, well, you don't know what the aliens want. Like, there'll be alien entities or interdimensional beings, like, but you don't know what their intent is because they are alien or they are sort of so non-human. Um, and that's what's really cool. Um, in many of these cases, like the you know, there's no explanation for, especially this. There's, there's probably more so later on in the in the series. Um, but in this first season, you get a load of episodes where they just do not provide an explanation. You get the answer, but you don't get an explanation. Fluke Man is a really good example. Eugene Toombs is another. Like these things exist, and they can do these things. And you, they, they take, um, they take you to a, a conclusion, but there's no explanation of where the Fluke Man comes from or Eugene Toombs, the where they come from. Or the fact that like Eugene Toons has been around for decades, centuries possibly, um, and I, I just love that thing that sort of like they're not there to provide you with a genetic explanation. They're not there to provide an explanation, just a conclusion. They're there to bring you to a conclusion, and it's sort of um, that's what I think this does so well. I can't remember if this episode does that, but that's where I'm, I'm reaching with. So let's keep going. We're getting towards the end now. We're coming to the final act, I think, really. 43 minutes we're going to go in, just thereabouts. So, <coughs> let's uh, hydrate and get into the finale. So they've tracked down the girl to the forest. They're about to see the thing. Um, this is typical. This this is wholly typical now. Mulder and Scully running through a location, whether it be, um, there you go, a warehouse or a forest, and he gets separated and Scully in particular gets sidelined. Um, I love the fact that you can att- you can basically hit an FBI agent. There doesn't seem to be any consequence to this. 
but they get separated, which then allows Mulder to witness the event and Scully to be held, you know, and delayed. Um, see, this is the thing again, you go, you've got no business on it. He's a fucking FBI agent. He's investigating a case. He, he's got full, like, um, you know, rights to be there. It's bizarre. Um, um, but protecting this small town. I wonder if this, you know, this idea happened with serial killers and that sort of thing. I mean, you know, how how these kids have gone missing and then they've or they've wound up dead, and um, in this this small town, this like. Does this mean that, like, for them, for the people that have been here, that have lived in this town, I mean, have they seen the UFOs? Are they all pretty sort of, like, comfortable knowing that they're like, oh, yeah, 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 no, we know this alien exists, this alien entity exists, this is a UFO, that we we are completely okay with that. Um, See, here you go. So, Mulder's at the heart of it. He's actually seeing the two kids getting beamed up and Scully, meanwhile, is sat back miles away and just sees a lit up in the forest. And what I like, actually, what clever is, it's lit up in the same way that it was lit up previously. So the last time they're in the forest, um, they're confronted. Um, the, the It was lit up, and you see that it's a car, a truck, with the overhead light rack on. So now she can be like, well, I just saw lights. That's all I saw. I don't know. It could be anything. And um, it gives that get out. Um, what I would say is, it gets a little repetitive. There's there's times when it's done really well, and then there's times when it's done really badly, um, and you know, really sort of contrived ways of keeping Scully away from the truth. Um, So there we have it. I think you know. So now we've got we're back to the the finale. So uh, Billy Loomis, not Billy Loomis, but Billy the boy you saw it all, um, is now back, and yet he's still in some sort of form of catatonic state, and he is recounting the the events. Um, but again, as we sort of get to see, I believe. And we get to we get the eighty nine the eighty nine event now. Um, the idea of the alien adoption, the testing place. Yep. So this we get this idea of you know, all the. Uh, they try to sort of. He's the one that was controlled. He was the one that was the sort of centre of it all, which is fine. It gives you this humanist thing of like, but there's no explanation as to why. They just said they took us to the testing place. All right, why these kids? Why Oregon? What makes them special? Or, or single them out? Or why there? You know, was there something particular in the air they wanted to sort of test? I know we're not going to get an answer. You're not supposed to. But again, you get the cigarette smoking man listening to it, and he's like, ah, you know. He forms he 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 creates such a fantastic um uh silhouette. Um also the fact that smoking aside nineteen ninety three, like not happening anymore. But it, it, yeah, it's a good ending, but this the the last part of this episode probably what I think really sold this. Um So this, again, so it's sort of like so she's obviously been there to report on him as as, she, as he said, uh, and the love of how that she she's now being criticised. Well, your reports don't seem to have any scientific base in reality, and she's like, well, I saw what I saw. You know, you you were basically asking me to to um, scupper Mulder, and in doing so, she sort of starts to validate him, even from this opening episode, which I think's really interesting. Again bringing us back to this idea of authority like she is doing what she was asked to do she's doing everything she can yet there is still an authority above her and above them that is saying that's not really what we wanted you're not actually doing what we said 
Um, so it's all coming together in this final sort of section, which I think is cool. And we get the little nose piece again right at the end, um, which is cool. And I'm just waiting now. I'm just waiting for that final bit in this episode because there's another one. There's another bit that's absolute an absolute doozy. Um, but she's got the evidence. Yeah, this was found in in Billy Miles. That was the name, Billy Miles, and in the the, the body that was found in the ground. So <laughs> we are not alone. I want to believe. All of those have become T-shirts eventually. I actually have a poster that says I want to believe and all that sort of stuff. Um. So yeah, I, I like that you can also see the obviously the offices change um, for the rest of the show. They clearly had this set up for just the pilot. But um, see, this is the cigarette smoker man going in again, and you just get that nod of he's clearly that sort of senior authority or that senior thing. Um, this is a bit of a problem. So at the end of this show, like you've had the abduction, you've had the interview. It does. It's trailing a bit now. It's it's it clearly f- it feels like they're padding time a little bit. Um, so they're now having this conversation. Mulder's now rang Scully, and then this is this final you know meant to be this final one. Look, it, it again. This feels dragged out. I think this should have been done face to face. Because um, it shows that she's still involved on this other stuff, but she's she's not yet able to sort of articulate her fears and what she's seen. It doesn't come up again, but I do think this would have been better than a sort of a face to face. Um, but this is it. There you go. So the final scene of this, and it comes up again. I think at the end of the series, but he's got the little vial with the the tracking device in it, and he's putting it into a box with a bunch of other shit that. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we've got a whole bunch of these, um, and uh, I'll just add this one to the pile, uh, to my collection. Um, I've now you know got more like a Boglin or a Pokemon, um, and you see this massive thing. So it's again, I love that some of the cardboard evidence. Now this is it. Him walking down this corridor with all this evidence in this warehouse bit is so Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um. It's so, you know, the way he's dressed as well, it's almost like it's supposed to be somewhere between Rage of the Lost Ark and like Rod Serling of sort of the Twilight Zone. But it's in the Pentagon. It's the Pentagon. So again, from the off, it's sort of setting you up to say, yeah, the government knows all this stuff and this is what they're going to He's at the Pentagon. Again, you're getting this idea of authority, this chain of command, this chain of, um, you know, above even above the cigarette smoking man is somebody else um so yeah i love that but a final note doesn't have the music yet pilot episode doesn't have the fantastic music uh by mark snow which comes i think with the second episode so anyway that's it we have done a pilot commentary i've tried to talk consistently for, for for almost an hour and you've had to listen to just me chatting on so i pr- hopefully you've enjoyed it hopefully that's been an interesting time um i've enjoyed actually watching that and talking about it we might do some more i'll probably get some more people on to talk about th- these uh these shows uh let me know what you think do you enjoy this commentary did you enjoy what we've done um and if so let me know come find us on twitter x files hashtag x files um other than that if you do want to talk about any of the episodes we've done or anything we've got coming up or anything you're aware of just want to come chat to me come find us uh pr- predominantly i live on twitter uh, at 20th century geek that's two zero th century geek come find me uh, check out the sister podcast. We've got another podcast, Stories Out of Time and Space, where me and my good friend Julian Darius, we talk about sci-fi movies. Every other week, we take a sci-fi movie and we dissect it and talk about all kinds of bits and pieces. Fantastic show. Uh, and that can be found at, at Pod Time Space. All these podcasts are available on all the, uh, the usual uh, podcast catchers. We are out in the ether. If you want to get in contact, though, please also you can email me. It's at 20thcenturygeek at gmail.com. Or you can find me on all the other plat- uh, social media platforms, Facebook, uh, Instagram are the big two. Uh, more than that, though, uh, we have a Patreon. Uh, help this podcast and Stories Out of Time and Space stay independent. We have got a whole bunch of um, content going out on there. First and foremost, I do a monthly podcast called 30 Minute Thoughts, where the the Patreons get to choose a topic 
uh, usually related to pop culture, and then I get to ruminate on it for 30 minutes and give my own thoughts. Uh, more than that, every quarter we have got Creators Corner, when I bring people in to talk about what it is they do, how they do it, and why they are a creative. This can be big creators, we had Kieran Gillen, or it can be local people. I've actually got a, uh, a documentary director called Jason Impley coming on for this next quarter. It's going to be fantastic. And finally, a brand new benefit for everybody. Me and Julian are going to be doing our Twilight Zone um saga our journey begins we are going to be discussing every single episode of the twilight zone in a weekly release it's going to be a video it's going to be a podcast uh, 15 minutes 15 to 20 minutes of us talking about each and every episode starting at the beginning and working our way through from 1959 onwards we're going to be talking about the twilight zone it's going to be great that's another thing for you to talk go out there and give you an excuse to go and watch twilight zone great benefits if you like what we do and you like tw- uh, 20th century pop culture check out the patreon it's uh, www.patreon.com slash 20 cg pod notes below anyway ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for listening hope you've enjoyed this show and i shall see you on the next episode mm-hmm.